Well, come on in, grab a seat, make your way back to your seats. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning about my favorite topic of end time stuff, and that is heaven. I, I, I am so excited to be able to go to heaven. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can be excited this morning because heaven is a reality. And it's interesting because we find the last book of the Bible, uh, Revelation, speaking about heaven. And the, in the last chapter of the last book of Revelation, Jesus invites us to, go ahead and say it, heaven. And, and so we're going to save that for our last message throughout this series called Thy Kingdom Come. And so I have a few thoughts for you this morning. I have a question or two for you this morning. But I really want you to understand um, what I'm going to lay before you this morning is like scraping a snow cone off of, a, off of an iceberg. You know, I, I, I'm only going to be able to offer a little bit, but it still tastes good. You know, it's, it's wonderful. And, and I want you to be excited about heaven. So I want to go to Revelation, the book of Revelation. And let's look at Revelation chapter 22, verse number 7. And once you're all there, whether you click there or turn there, that's up to you. Um, once we're all there, I want us to bow our heads and we'll pray for heaven. Okay, let's pray. Father... As we think about heaven and all that you have promised that it will be, we sit, all of us, on this side of heaven and our, our minds just go crazy thinking about all the possibilities and once that will be, what, what that will be like. And Lord, we do that in the midst, in the midst of all of that, what life throws at us and what we experience. So, so Lord, we... We take our minds right now and we take all our stuff and we set it to the side, uh, as legitimate as our stuff is, and we, we give you our whole attention right now. And we open our minds and our hearts to be filled with the truth that comes from your word. Thank you, Lord, for heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. So Revelation 22, 7, here's what it says. And behold, I am coming soon. And those, those are the words of Jesus. I am coming soon. And, and the word behold there is, is like get ready. Jesus is, is excited about his return to gather the church and take the church to heaven to be with him. So it's a, it's a word of encouragement. It's a word that we can get excited about that. And, and, and would you just say this with me? I am coming soon. Say that. I am coming soon. Outstanding. I hope that excites you. Does that excite you? Good. Good. It excites me to know that my Lord and my Savior is also excited about coming to snatch us away and take us to be with him forever. He says, and behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Do you know where Jesus was speaking from when he said that? Heaven. Do you know the place where the whole book originates? Heaven. And do you know where we are going one day? Heaven. It's hard sometimes to fathom, fathom in all that we're going through in life, the trials and the tribulations and the struggles and the question marks and the brokenness and, and all of the things that we do to ourselves and, and think that heaven is a reality. But I believe that's why Jesus put it at the end of the book to say, don't forget. Don't forget my heart for you and don't forget the wonderful promises that are in store for you. So this morning what I'd like to do is just take a few minutes and look at some of the beautiful aspects of heaven. Shall we do that together? Here's the first thing that I want to, to answer and that is what will heaven be like? In 1 John chapter 3 verse number 2, I will read this. It says, dear friends, now we are children of God. 
And what we will has not yet been made known, but we know that when he, Jesus, appears, we shall be like him. So we know that we are going to be changed physically, and we are also going to be changed spiritually. We're going to become like Jesus. How wonderful that is. So here are a few things that, that, that can bring encouragement to you today, no matter what you're facing. The first I find is that we will no longer sin. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about the prospect of not sinning anymore because, frankly, a lot of my time gets taken up by me sinning. And a lot of my time gets taken up repenting for the sins. I can't imagine how productive I'm going to be in heaven when I'm not sinning all the time. <laughs> what about you? What about the prospect of never sinning again? Uh, I can't imagine, but I'm really looking forward to it. You know, um, I have a boat. And, and Karen, my wife's probably going, oh, yeah, he has a boat. But, but in this last year on my boat, I have replaced the, the live well aerator, the bilge. I've replaced the lower unit on the boat, the lower unit on the boat. I've, I've replaced the, 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 um, um, the, the caulking that goes around the, the, um, the T-top. I've replaced uh, flares. I've replaced, and I, you know, I'm just looking forward to that day when I can shoot across Tampa Bay and the boat is as it is supposed to be. <laughs> but, it, but it seems like every time, every time I go out on the water, something breaks. <laughs> but, you know, I still love it. I still enjoy being out there, and I'm just really thankful that it's not like huge big-ticket items. Those are rare, but, but I, I really do. I was brought up on the water, and I enjoy salt water, and, and so I, I have the privilege of owning a, a little boat, and, and I certainly enjoy my time on the boat, but that's, that's really how I look forward to heaven as well, and that is that, that it seems like as I go through life, stuff breaks. Does your stuff break too? And, and I thought I was cruising just fine, and all of a sudden it's, uh-oh, it ain't working. And, and I know, though, that one day we're all going to cruise to the bay of heaven, and we'll be able to look around and say, everything is working. Everything is just the way that it's supposed to be. And a key feature of that for me is that I won't be sinning anymore. Number two, we will not be subject to the law of physics. Do you realize that? And, and the older that I'm not old, but the older that I get, here's what I realize. Gravity really does impact a person's life. When I was, when I was younger, gravity didn't impact me. I ruled over gravity, and, and now it seems like gravity is much stronger than when it was when I was younger, and specifically in the morning when I'm trying to get out of bed. The, the, <laughs> the gravity there is just like, Rah. I was like, who put the kryptonite in the bed? It's crazy we aren't even going to be subject to the laws of physics when we get to heaven. You realize that? We'll, we'll be able to go where the Lord Jesus sends us without being hindered by time unless we choose to be or the Lord chooses for us to walk with people who will be subject to time and space, but we'll be able to be like Jesus. As a matter of fact, here's what... Here's what uh, 1 John chapter 20, verse uh, 26 says. Uh, eight days later, his disciples were inside again. They were inside the upper room. The doors were locked. Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. So here's Jesus after the resurrection. He's, he's walking through walls and he's walking through doors. And he is able to be present wherever he wants to be. But understand, we are going to be like him. Who knows? Maybe we'll be talking in heaven and talking about Mars, and we say, hey, let's go to Mars and figure this out. Boom, we're there. Or have you ridden down a black hole yet? That is the coolest thing on 
Well, I can't say on earth. That's the coolest thing in the universe. So maybe we'll all take a field trip and, and slide down a black hole. You laugh. But could you imagine living, living with no physical limitations any longer, not bound by gravity? And Now, I'm reminded of the physical laws oftentimes when I walk around in my house and there are objects that I cannot pass through. And I assume sometimes that I can, like closed doors and cupboards and different things like that. And, and, and I often think, you know, I cannot wait till that will never happen again. And it might be as easy as to open the door or close the cupboard, but, you know, you'd like to think about the opportunity to just walk right through it, right? Uh, number three, this is one of my favorite. We are going to be able to eat and to touch. But see, because of the physical laws we live in today, uh, we eat to, to survive. But in heaven, we are going to eat for pleasure's sake. We'll have the enjoyment of joining together in, in, in fellowship around food. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, it tells us, eating will be done for pleasure. It tells us that, that um, we, the imperishable cannot take on perishable. So there's nothing about our physical body in heaven where we're going to need, um, we, we, you know, oh no, my heart's going to stop, or oh no, if I don't get food, I'm going to die. Those days will be over, and we will be fully alive, imperishable forever. But food's going to be there. As a matter of fact, in Revelation, it talks about the tree that's going to be in heaven, that every month it produces 12 different kinds of fruit. And, you know, I love fruit, and, and maybe you do too, but could you imagine the taste of that fruit together and all of the other things that we'll prepare for each other and, and how we will fellowship together around food and also the opportunity to touch and nothing's going to hurt us? Able to pick up anything, and it can't sting us, it won't bite us, it won't crush us. Eating and touching will be free there. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thought. Here's another thought. Number four is that we will never be sick again. How has sickness of others touched your life or maybe even touched uh, your life personally? How, ha, have you ever lost anyone due to an illness or a sickness and how it grieves our hearts? Or maybe we've walked through times in our life where we've had life-threatening illnesses or circumstances where we didn't know if we were going to live or not. Well, in heaven, there will be no more sicknesses of, that, of, of, of any kind whatsoever. You and I will not be susceptible in an imperishable body to any form of sickness. No tragedy. No accidents, no more worrying about children coming home late so that you can go to sleep. Not that I have any kids that do that. Well, how about relationally? The, the awkwardness of, of going um, into situations where you don't know these people, you don't know what their agenda is, and, and you're just kind of kind of maneuvering through, trying to find some common ground. You will never have to do that in heaven because all relationships will be free and open and true and no guile. And, and there will be a wonderful opportunity to have depth and kindness will rule and love will rule. Relationships will be amazing, absolutely amazing. And as I'm speaking about that, I want you to understand, too, that we are going to recognize each other. Some people, I hear this question fairly often, and that is, in heaven, am I going to recognize my family? You know, that's a valid question. But I want to suggest to you that you are going to know not only family, but I want to suggest that you're going to know everyone in heaven when you go to heaven. I want to suggest that everyone in heaven is going to know you. Let me share with you a verse that comes out of Matthew chapter 17. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. That is talking with Jesus. Now, Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus, but James, Peter, and John recognized who they were. How did they do that, not ever having seen them before? They didn't have pictures back then. 
Because in the presence of God, Peter, James, and John knew who they were. And I want to suggest to you that when you get to heaven, you're going to have the opportunity to know and be known and that you're going to know everyone. Um, when I was younger, I used to, um, we, we would go to churches um, all the time, different churches. My mom and dad were on deputation and um, you know, we, we had the opportunity. We moved a lot as well, probably more so than the deputation that they did. Um, and, and I can remember I used to use the smell technique going into a new church. Have you ever smelled churches before? And, um, and not that they're bad, but I could size up as a kid. I could size up a church by the smell because you, some churches you walk into and, and it's got that flannel graph paste that you can eat smell to it. And, and you just know you got to watch out you know, in those, in those kinds of churches. Other churches, you know, you, you would smell coffee or fresh carpet or different things. I mean, you're looking at me like I'm crazy, but, but uh, and by the way, I use this on people too. So just, just wanting you to know. Listen, when you've got a nose like this, you put it to good use, all right? So if you see me walking around, you know what's going on. I'm checking you out. And, and I, I want to suggest you try that as well. Just be careful. Some people, you don't want to do that too close because... Uh, you'll get more than you bargained for. But I understand, heaven, heaven is a place where there are relationships, deep relationships. Listen to this. In Matthew chapter 22, verse number 30. For in the resurrection, they neither, they, that's you and me, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Wait a second, Pastor David, are you saying that, that I'm not going to have my wife or my husband in heaven? That's exactly what I'm saying. But I love her or I love him. I know that you do. But see, here's, here's the thing. When sin entered into the world back when Adam and Eve sinned, there's something that came along with sin that has corrupted every relationship on earth. Every relationship on earth except the relationships that Jesus himself had. And that is shame. When shame comes into a person's life and it happens at the point of sin, when shame comes in, we hide just like Adam and Eve hid from the Lord. Why? Because they, they saw something different about themselves. They recognized their nakedness, Genesis chapter 3 on, and every one of us are the same. It's one of the reasons why we have clothes on today. Thank you very much. We recognize our shame. But I want you to notice something in the very first marriage on earth between a man and a woman. They were in the garden, Genesis chapter 2, before shame, before sin came into the world. We find God looking at these two no sin, and he's blessed in his heart, he's happy. And of all the things that he could have said, he says this. The man and the woman were in the garden naked. You know the rest of the verse? And they felt no shame. How powerful then is it that God would have us live with no shame? That before shame was even in the world, that he would speak to it. Genesis chapter 3. Heaven is a place where there's no shame. You nor I are not going to have to paint any facade to be accepted or approved of or loved by anybody. We will be who we were intended to be by God and we will be accepted for who we are. How amazing will that be? And that absence of shame will take us deeper in relationships with everyone in heaven than the closest marriage on earth. All marriages and all people are tainted with shame. We are. I can't wait. I wonder what it will be like to know and, and be fully known at that level by everyone. How beautiful that's going to be. Now, I want to also share with you that, and, and this is, this is critical and, and, in my view, the most important of all that I want to share with you this morning. And that is that we will be with Christ in heaven. We'll be with Jesus. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking outside. And it was very apparent to me this last week as I was thinking about this that it's hot in Florida, right? I mean, whether I go 
inside my truck, it's hot there. Step outside, it's hot there. Walk down the road, it's hot there. I touch something, that's hot too. It's crazy in Florida, if you're new to Florida, in the summertime in Florida, there isn't anything that's not touched by the heat of the sun. But I want you to capture that thought for a second because that's exactly how heaven's going to be, except it's not going to be heat, it's going to be love. Everything in heaven is going to be touched by the love of God. There won't be any place in heaven that's not touched by the love of God. Whether people grab, uh, gather in twos or whether they're in millions, the love of God is going to permeate and transcend everything. And it's not like we're going to run from it. We're just going to stand in it constantly, forever, never interrupted, always, always in the presence of of love and joy and peace. Can you get used to that? I can get used to that. I'm looking forward to that. The last thought I have for you is this. You know, I've been talking about, like, a, like I said, a little snow cone, right? A little snow cone scraped off the iceberg, but, but here's, here's something critical. I want us to stop for a moment, and I want us to look at the gates of heaven, all right? The gates are important because we've been talking about what's going on inside of heaven, just looking at a very few items that the scripture would bring to our attention. But as we think about the gates of heaven, did you know that the Bible says that the gates of heaven are... are uh, 12 individual pearls that, that each gate is made out of one pearl without any seam whatsoever. And my first thought about that being from salt water is I really would like to see the clam that that came from. <laughs> but, you know, it's probably there on some distant planet that God has prepared or I don't know. But understand this, the gates are real and the gates are beautiful. But I want to draw our attention to the gates for just a minute or two. And I've got three verses that I want to put in front of you. Starting in Revelations chapter 22, verse number 14. Would you listen to this? Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Hey, would you say those three words with me? By the gates. That was okay. Try it one more time. By the gates, okay. Outside, outside the gates, outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Now think with me. I, I want you to imagine that you're standing and you're looking at these gates of heaven right now. You're looking at the gates of heaven. They're massive. They're huge. But I want you to know these gates are the thickest gates that any human being has ever encountered in all of the eons of time. These gates are the tallest, the most well-guarded gates that you could possibly imagine. But I also want you to know these gates discriminate. These gates are bias. These gates are exclusive. You see, there are many people when they begin to think about heaven, they think about, I can't wait till I get there. And, and they, it's like they look over their shoulder and they say, because I was born this race, I get to go to heaven. Or because I have overcome this and this and this, I get to go to heaven. Because I have been to church on Sunday, I get to go to heaven. Because I've lived a good life, I get to go to heaven. But I'm here to tell you these gates discriminate. They're exclusive. And all that is in heaven is, is for those who would get inside heaven. But it's important that you know how to pass through the gate. Listen to this. Jesus was teaching on this in Matthew chapter 19, verse 24, 25, and 26. Listen to what Jesus says about these gates. He said, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. 
Now here, he's pointing at rich people, but he's putting the rich people in the same category as anyone who would look at anything in their life to get them through the gates. And what he said really startled the disciples, and so they said when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who, who then can be saved? And in verse number 26, Jesus said, With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The most remarkable thing about the gates of heaven is actually who goes through the gates. It's really remarkable. Because those who would stand on the outside of heaven and look in and say, because I have, because I have done, because I am, because I have accomplished, because I survived, because how I was born, all those individuals who would say that are on the outside of heaven. And those who go through the gates of heaven are those who have come to the gates, listen, listen, bankrupt, broken, crushed by this world. And I, I guess the word that would sum it up best is needy. Needy. Those who come to the gate needy will get entrance into heaven. Those who come with anything that they've accomplished or anything that they believe gives them a right or an entitlement can never know the blessings of the inside of those gates. Let me finish this morning with something that Jesus said, making it perfectly clear about the gates of heaven. Listen to what he said in John chapter 10, verse number 9. I am the gate. Say that with me. I am the gate. He's the gate. He goes on to say, whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Would you just picture for a second, you're standing in the front of the gates and heaven is right before you and, and, and there's, there's a door there and you, you can walk right through. The gates open for you, but it's Jesus who is standing there and he's happy to see you. He's happy to know you and there you are. Would you say to Jesus, Jesus, look at all that I have done. Look at what I have become. Look how often I have been to church. Look how my children grew up. Look what I've overcome in my life. He wouldn't have a word to say. But what if you, what if you said this this morning? Jesus, I need you. I need you. See, those of you in here who have said that to him already in your life, that doesn't bring any kind of distress to you. You, you fully can just get up right underneath that and go, oh, yeah, I do need Jesus every day. And I know him as my Lord. And I know that when I get to the gates of heaven, I'm going to have a rich, warm welcome because Jesus Christ has saved me from my bankruptcy. He's saved me from my, my decisions and brokenness and pain and sorrow and sin. He has saved me. But there are some of you in here right now, when I, when I say to you, say this, Jesus, I need you, you feel distressed. Do you know why? Because you're still believing that there's something you can do to get you through those gates. Until you come bankrupt, bankrupt, empty, broken, and needy, you can't get in. Let's do this together this morning. Let's say this together. Some of you, you've got you've to you've gotta say this and get this into your system. I need Jesus. Some of you need to cry out. For the first time in your life, I need Jesus. 
I need Jesus. I need him to save me from my sin. I need him to restore my life. And ultimately, the only way I'm ever going to see the inside of heaven is Jesus, his love, his mercy, and his grace. Let's just say that together. I need Jesus. Yeah, one more time, one more time. I need Jesus. Father, you've heard your people this morning. I so long to be in heaven. And Lord, we know this morning the only way is through the gate. Jesus, you called yourself the gate. And we believe you. Lord, my prayer is for those right now who, who at this very moment, they're receiving you. They're accepting the truth that, Jesus, you're the gate. God, would you give them courage and strength to believe that at the depth of who they are. In Jesus' name, amen.